in the end of December at some point, so look for that. I'm really excited to be part of that. But I'm also here at Spring Lake Church, part of the teaching team. And so I would like to start today by telling you a story. Once upon a time, there was a great Bible teacher. And this guy had it all. He preached using all sorts of different methods, and he taught equally well in every genre of text. He preached wisdom literature like Proverbs. Sometimes he would employ apocalyptic imagery and talk about future events. He preached expositions of the Old Testament. He used metaphors. He taught conversationally with people over meals. He even taught using questions. He was so good that people would come from all over the land to hear him preach. And the curious thing was that every time he preached, he would elicit different responses in the crowd. Some people were confused. Some people were angry. Some people were overwhelmed. But there was always this one thing that the teacher did that left people asking more questions than they came with. The teacher would simply tell a story. Now, on the surface level, the story was always about something really common, like a sheep or a coin or a wedding. But no matter what it was about, you always got the sense that it was, there was much more to it than just the simple story. Now, of course, this great teacher isn't Pastor Jack, it's not Pastor Ryan, and it's certainly not myself. It's Jesus. And his common stories with deeper meanings were called parables. Jesus often used parables as a method for revealing deeper truths, particularly about God's kingdom. It was part of his central teaching. And so in order for us to really understand the full scope of Jesus' teaching, we have to consider his parables. And so today, it's my privilege to get to start a new series that we're calling Once Upon a Time, about the parables of Jesus. Now, Once Upon a Time might make you think in your mind about fairy tales, but these weren't really fairy tales per se, but more short stories with a deeper meaning. In fact, the word for parable in Greek carries with it an idea of casting alongside something or placing two things side by side. And so Jesus' parables were stories that were cast alongside or placed next to truth in order to illustrate that truth. That's really the first uh, blank in your outline this morning. Parables are short stories that were cast alongside or placed next to truth in order to illustrate that truth. And so for Jesus and his parables, those truths were about the kingdom of God. Ryan's going to talk more about the kingdom next week, but today to launch us, I have purposely picked a passage of scripture that's going to reveal to us a couple different insights into his parables. First, we're going to discover from Jesus himself why he uses parables to teach. And second, we're going to wrestle with how God's word is received by looking at one of Jesus' more well-known parables. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up this morning to Matthew 13, 1 through 23. If you'd like to use a seat pocket Bible near you, uh, it's on page 690, I believe. Or you can use a mobile device. While you're turning there to Matthew 13, I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, you have given us ears. Let us hear. Lord, we know that when we hear your word and we don't respond the way that you call us to, the problem is not with you. The problem is not with your word, but the problem is with us. So Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and receive your word. Lord, that you would use your word to do its work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13, 1 through 23. Now, this, this is an extended passage of Scripture. It's a little bit long, but it's important for us to see an overview of it. And so we're going to read through the whole thing first, and then we'll go back and take a closer look. That same day, Jesus went out of his house, or out of the house, and sat by the lake. Such large cr crowds gathered around him that he got in a boat, and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, 
a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and so it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop of 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Verse 10, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever, been, whoever has will be given more, and, who, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts has become callous. And they, they hardly hear with their ears. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears, or see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And in turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message of all the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling on the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what is sown. This is God's word. Now, I'm excited to get to talk about this actual parable that we see in here because it's going to actually challenge us a lot. But before we get into that, um, I want to take a look at the middle section of this passage, and we're going to consider why Jesus use, uses the parables. So the disciples, they come to Jesus, and they realize that there's a lot of people in the crowd who don't understand what Jesus is saying when he's using parables. And, and so they go to Jesus and they ask something like this. Hey, Jesus, why are you using parables? Like, why don't you just tell them plainly about the kingdom? Like, why don't you just tell them in plain language? Why do you have to use these parables? It, it's really a good question if you think about it. The disciples are wondering, why are you using this method, Jesus? And we're going to discover in this text that Jesus uses parables because it always effectively reveals and reinforces the heart of the listener either way. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look starting in verse 10. The disciples come to Jesus and they, of course, ask Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And he replies to them, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. You know, when I was studying this passage, I kept thinking, Come on, Jesus, really? What kind of answer is that? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, or even what they have is taken away from them? I mean, come on. What are you saying here, Jesus? And it reminds me of this story that I read a few years ago about Jack Whitaker. Jack Whitaker is the winner of the 2002 Powerball Lottery jackpot. It was, at the time, the largest jackpot ever won by a single winning ticket. Now, even though the prize money was over $300 million, Jack chose the cash option, and he got $113.3 million after taxes. Here's the kicker, though. At the time of winning the jackpot, Mr. Whitaker was already worth $17 million. Life is so unfair, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, really, a rich man wins the lottery? Come on! 
So the question is, is this the same situation that Jesus is presenting to his disciples? The rich only get richer? Is that the heart of God? I think the answer here is no. In order to understand this part of the passage, you have to think about the audience. Who is Jesus talking to and what is he trying to communicate? This is Jesus talking directly to his disciples at this point. No one else is around. And we have to remember that we have to remember who these disciples are. You see, these disciples have come to understand Jesus is the Messiah. Not only that, but they've left everything to follow him. They are by no means rich in the worldly standard. They responded to God's call to follow Jesus. And now Jesus is telling them that they have a special place in the kingdom of God. They sit in a place where they get to hear the deep mysteries of the kingdom of God, and they're in a position to actually grasp it because their hearts are open to Jesus. And so here is the basic principle. In order to benefit from the speaking of God's truth, you must first have responded to God's call. Those who respond to Jesus' call and give their hearts and their lives over to him will hear the words of Jesus and they'll gain more understanding. Whoever has will be given more. But understanding only comes when you have real, true commitment. You see, the principle here is that in the kingdom of God, you can't just dabble in following Jesus. It's all or nothing. Full commitment is required to gain knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom. And so Jesus speaks in parables because for those who are truly committed, it adds insight and depth about his kingdom. But also, for those who are hardened against Jesus, it brings further separation and misunderstanding. Remember I said, the parables of Jesus reinforce and reveal the heart of the listener. And so look what happens when you harden yourself against God. Look at verse 13. This is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this, is, for this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Jesus perfectly describes the situation of those who have already set themselves up against God and his truth. They hear, but they don't understand. They see, but they don't perceive. It says that they have closed their eyes, and so the parables reveal their hearts. Jesus' description of this story always reminds me of the emperor's new clothes. No, not the emperor's new groove. That's a Disney movie. I know you all thought that. The emperor's new clothes. It's a story. Once upon a time, there lived an emperor, and he loved clothes. He spent all of his time trying out new clothes. Two travelers, they heard about the emperor and his love for the clothes, and so they decided to fool the emperor and make some money while they were doing it. They went to the emperor, and they introduced themselves as famous tailors from a faraway land. And they told the emperor that they would make a special outfit for him that fools would not be able to see. The emperor readily agreed. And so the two men, they received a large sum of money, but they only pretended to sew the clothes. Many curious ministers went to see the special outfit, but they saw nothing. Still, they praised the garment, fearing that they would be seen as fools. And the travelers, they eventually go to the emperor with their creation. And like the others, the emperor too saw nothing, But he didn't want to admit he was a fool, and so he praised the outfit. He wore it to the parade the next day. He was naked, okay? Just want to be clear about that. He was butt naked, okay? Can you say that on stage, butt naked? I don't know. I did. He wore it for the parade the next day, and the entire town had gathered to see the special outfit. And so the emperor, proud of his clothes, is marching down the street as all the subjects cheered loudly, even though none of them saw any clothes. Finally, one girl, who didn't know any better, says, why isn't the emperor wearing any clothes? And slowly the people start whispering, and they realize 
they had all been fooled. The emperor turns red with shame, and he wants to punish those travelers. But behold, they had already run away. Now, of course, the moral of this story is a little different from what Jesus is saying, but there's some interesting similarities with the people in this story. The emperor and his ministers, and even the town folk, refused to see the truth about the invisible clothes. Fearing they would be seen as fools, they believed and acted on a lie rather than seeing the truth that was right in front of them. It's the same heart condition for those who hear the parables of Jesus and their hearts are darkened instead of seeing the truth. In order for them to really understand Jesus, the people would have had to humble themselves. They would have given up living for themselves. If Jesus is who he says he is, if what is he, he's saying about the kingdom is true, then everything I know gets turned upside down. And then what if I was wrong about Jesus? What if Jesus turned out to be not who he said he was? I would look like a fool. And so just like everyone in the story was worried about looking like a fool, the people hearing these parables were worried about looking like the fool. And if that's your attitude towards God, if that's your heart towards him, then it doesn't really matter how plain the teaching is. It doesn't really matter if Jesus is speaking in a parable or he's speaking just truth directly to you. You're not in the position to, teach, to, to receive it. And so why does Jesus teach parables? Because it reveals and reinforces the heart of the listener either way. So hopefully that will help you during these next several weeks as we study the parables. Now I want to take a look at this particular parable that we find in Matthew 13 that we read. It's the parable of the sower or the farmer. And we'll look at the original telling of the parable and Jesus' interpretation together. So let's look at this thing from the beginning. Uh, if you look in verse 3, it says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. If you jump down to verse 19, it says, Jesus interprets this, and he says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Okay, now I want to talk about the first soil, but first let's set up the context for what's happening here. You have to know something. I believe that Matthew, who's writing this, wants us to see Jesus as the farmer or the sower in the story. There's two reasons why. First, in the next parable in, in Matthew 13, uh, we see that Jesus identifies himself as the sower at the end of the chapter. So it makes sense that Jesus is the sower in this one as well. But second, the message or the seed is about the kingdom of God, which is Jesus' core message. In fact, there's over 80 times in the New Testament, well, 80 times in the Gospels, where Jesus is referred to in association with this kingdom of God. But anyway, suffice it to say that the farmer here is Jesus. And so let's put this into context. Jesus comes out of this house, and there's this giant crowd that's gathered. There's so many people, in fact, that Jesus has to get on a boat and go out a little ways from the shore so that all these people don't press in on him. And he tells a story where, remember, he is the main character sowing the seed. And so do you see what's happening here in this story? The parable that Jesus is telling is actually being lived out at the very moment that Jesus is telling it. Remember, Jesus tells parables to communicate or reveal some sort of truth about his kingdom. And the farmer in the story is sowing a seed, and in verse 19 we see that the seed is the message of the kingdom. And so Jesus is using a parable at this point in time to describe something that's happening in the exact moment. The message of the kingdom is being proclaimed, and Jesus in real time is identifying how people are receiving the message as he's saying it. That's incredible. Think about that. Jesus is like doing some next level ninja skills on these people. And you have to know that this message that he's giving as he's teaching these people, it's not just any message. Jesus is talking about the message of the kingdom. The seed in the story is the message that there is grace and salvation found in him. 
And so let's consider how people respond to Jesus' message of salvation as he says it. The first soil, the soil that's sown along the path, it represents a person who hears the gospel message but doesn't understand it and therefore never really does anything with it. So Satan comes and snatches it away. In other words, it's entirely possible to hear the gospel message and know the plain sense of what is being said and never fully understand it truly for yourself. And the result of this is that the message of salvation that once reached your heart is taken away. I believe that this is a lot of people in our culture right now. The majority of people around us have exposure to the message of Jesus. They know what Jesus is about, or they think they do, but they've never really dug deeper to truly grasp it for themselves. Think about how many people have heard the message of Jesus. His teaching, his life, his death, his resurrection, Christmas, Easter, and they still have not responded to his call. If they stay in this condition and never seek to understand the message of salvation for themselves, the seed of salvation will be taken away from them. It's a spiritual battle. Satan comes and snatches away the seed. Actually, I get this mental image when I think about this. Everyone close your eyes for a second. Imagine for a second that you're in a pitch black room. It's so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Jesus is in the room with you. And Jesus, um, some people have met Jesus, and they've chosen to follow him and trust him. And what Jesus does is he gives everyone who's chosen to follow him and trust him night vision glasses so that they can see. Now open your eyes. Now there's other people in the room, right? And all these other people in the room, they've heard about Jesus and we're all standing there saying to these people, listen, if you want to see, if you want to get out of the room, if you want to have salvation, you need to meet Jesus. You need to trust Jesus. And the people are saying, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I trust Jesus. I don't know if, if I've heard about him. I've heard people have gotten some sight from him. But I don't know if, I really, I don't know if I'm really yet ready to trust Jesus. And so they continue to stumble around. And if they continue in this state, if they continue to reject Jesus, pretty soon their hope of ever seeing is going to be gone. So if that's you this morning, if you know the message of Jesus, but you've never fully trusted him, I want to say to you, don't wait. Jesus is real. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation is found and nobody else. He's the one who will show you the light of salvation. Let's look at the second soil. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. When the sun came up and the plants were scorched, they withered away because they had no root. Jump ahead to verse 20 and 21. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Now, one of the best ways to think about this heart condition is a fair weather fan or bandwagon people, okay? And uh, many of you know this about me. I said this in a sermon recently. Uh, but I am a huge Chicago sports fan, okay? I know boo and hiss and all those things, right? Um, I've literally liked the Cubs since I was four years old when I went to my first game at Wrigley Field. Now, my dad and brother, they're White Sox fans. They uh, converted some time ago. And uh, the same thing would happen every year of my life with my dad. Every year, he would say to me, just wait till September, in other words, if you're a Cubs fan and they're having a good season uh, and you think they're going to go places, just wait till September and you'll be sorry. Well, my dad was right for lots of years, right? They always choked in September until last year, okay? Because that saying died an abrupt death 
when after 108 years, the Cubs finally won the World Series. And this year, they're once again leading the NL Central by four and a half games, even though they lost to the Brewers yesterday, okay? <laughs> but here's why I mention that. The biggest annoyance that I had last fall, as the Cubs are winning and as the steam train is going forward to win, are the people who magically became Cubs fans in 2016. I mean, really, you know how many times I went to a Cubs game and I watched them lo lose? You know how many times I was watching on TV and they get to the playoffs and then they just choke? Do you know how many times that I had to sit through that and I still stayed a Cubs fan? And now you got these people who in 2016, they buy their first Cubs hat and all of a sudden they're super fans. I mean, come on. And you know what the worst part about this is, right? You know what will happen. You know exactly what will happen with these people. As soon as the Cubs have a losing season, or two, or 108, <laughs> these people are going to be gone. It's the same phenomenon, actually, than the people who hear the message of salvation. And they're really excited, and they love all the positivity. They start coming to church activities, and they love the good music, and the message makes them feel inspired. But in the end, the enthusiasm is short-lived. When it gets hard and trouble and persecution come, and it will, they fall away. Now, I believe that we're in a time in American history where the tide is quickly turning. Public sentiment towards authentic Bible-believing Christians is souring. We're entering a time period where it's going to start costing you more and more to be a follower of Jesus. And at first, it might just be the loss of respect from your coworkers or your neighbors or your friends or your family. But soon, it might be the loss of your job or the loss of your business and on and on. And so when the tough times come, and they will, what will, it, what will it reveal about your faith in Christ? The warning to us from Jesus in this is that if Christianity is just a fad for you, if it's just a season of life where you just need more positivity, if it's just uh, putting roots in circumstances and not in the person of Jesus, you are in danger of falling away as soon as it gets tough. Make sure your roots go deep. Let's talk about the third soil. Verse 7, Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And then verse 22, The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. This, is, this one always reminds me of the rich young man in Matthew 19. If you don't know the story, uh, this rich man comes up to Jesus and he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus says, you know, why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who's good. If you want to enter life, you have to keep the commandments. Uh, such as, you need to not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, all these things, and the man says, all these things I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me and you'll have eternal life. And the young man hears this and he walks away sad because he had great wealth. So think about the implications of this story for a second. The man wanted wealth in this life more than he wanted eternal life through Jesus. This is a word of caution for us who live in one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Your desire for the things of this world, your desire for the good life here and now, has the potential to choke out the fruit of salvation in your life. Fight to make sure that Jesus in his kingdom is the greatest treasure in your life. You know, there's a quick way to know where you are 
at the, with this and it's just by asking a simple question. What is your greatest wish? What do you pine for and want the most? If it's season tickets to the Packers game, you might have weeds in your heart. If it's $100 billion, you might have weeds in your heart. If it's perfect health and prosperity for your family all the days of your life, you might have weeds in your heart. My hope is that my greatest desire would be like King David in Psalm 27.4. One thing I ask, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. In other words, although I struggle, like everybody else, I want my chief desire to be God himself. And I hope that's you too. The fourth soil. Verse 8. Still other seed fell on the good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And so this is where we want to be as followers of Jesus. Good soil. And I want to close with some characteristics of good soil that we find in this passage so that we can begin to cultivate this soil in our lives. There's three characteristics. First, good soil hears the word of God. Good soil hears the word of God. Now, I want to point some, out something interesting in this part of the passage. Previously, with the soils prior to this one, the language suggests that the person received at one point in time the word of God and then it talks about the result. But in this soil, the language suggests that the man who received the word continues to hear the word. Verse 23, but the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and he continues to hear it. In other words, there is an ongoing continuation of hearing the word. And we need to be in this place as followers of Jesus. We need to be at weekend services. Not just to say we, could, we did it, but because we need to hear the word of God. We need to be in a community of believers like a small group where the word of God is shared and studied. We need to read and understand the word for ourselves. We need to keep on hearing the word of God and receiving it. That's the soil that's ready for God's message. Good soil also accepts the word. Hearing the message is not enough. We have to accept it. Too often, people believe that just going to church is going to help them become a more mature disciple of Jesus. Like, as long as you check the box on the weekend service, you're going to grow, and you're going to mature as a disciple of Jesus. It's not enough to just keep hearing the message of the kingdom. We have to respond to it. We have to accept it. It's really an idea of conforming ourselves to the truth and the reality of God's word. Especially when our word contradicts our thinking or our sensibilities. You know, we don't submit the word of God to our judgments. We submit ourselves to the word of God. Accepting means that we allow God's truth and word to shape us instead of the other way around. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So good soil hears God's word, and good soil accepts God's word, and good soil bears fruit. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human words, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Meaning that if you hear and accept God's truth as his truth, it will be at work in you. It's going to change you. It's going to transform you. It's going to produce fruit. That means whenever the word of God is preached, whenever you encounter it, you should be open and willing to take steps towards realigning your life to match with that truth. In faith, you should be looking for the next step to take in order to be obedient to the word that you heard and accepted. When you respond to God's word in this way, you will bear fruit. And over the years, you should be able to look back at your life 
and see how God's word has shaped you and transformed you. And so today, as you walk out of here, some of you might need to till your soil. You need to break up the ground, make it an inviting place for the seed. Some of you might need to pick the rocks. If you talk to farmers around here, especially in Door County, you know that they constantly, as they're tilling their field, have to pick rocks. You might have to do that in your life to make sure the roots go deep. Other of you have some weeds that you need to pull in your life. You need to consider, what do I love more than Jesus? But no matter what it is, take the time to get the soil right. Cultivate a soil that continues to hear, continues to accept, continues to bear fruit.